Praise the Lord, everyone. Good to see you in Sunday school today. Looks like our number's a little bit down on the 4th of July weekend, but I'm glad to be in church today. I knew we were going to have several out of our Sunday school class. There's some uh, traveling on vacation, Brother Chad, Sister Amy, and their family's going on vacation this week. And uh, Sister Wilbanks, Sister Connie Doles, Brother Gary, they're uh, attending a baby dedication this morning, so I knew they wasn't going to be here. Several more that I know this uh, on vacation. Let's pray for them to have safe travels and enjoy their vacation. But it's sure good to see you that made it today in Sunday school. We're celebrating the 4th of July weekend. Aren't you thankful for our freedoms this morning? Uh, it seems like a lot of our freedoms have been taken away from us slowly but surely. But uh, I'm glad I'm still living in the United States, and I'm thankful for our freedom that we have this morning. Thankful for those that uh, fought and died for our freedom. Uh, thankful for the Constitution that the uh, Lord helped them provide and put together for us. And uh, I'm just thankful for the 4th of July. I'm very patriotic. I love our country. Uh, I don't necessarily like what it's become lately, but I do love our country, and I'm glad I'm living in the United States instead of some somewhere else today. So let's be thankful for our freedoms today. All throughout the day, we'll have services uh, all day uh, geared toward that. Then tomorrow, of course, a lot of people will be off tomorrow on celebrating the 4th of July. But let's celebrate our freedom and thank God that we still live in the United States of America where we're free to live and choose our lives. Let's all stand this morning. We do have some prayer requests to go to the Lord in prayer. Sister Helen Sellers is back in the hospital, so let's lift her up this morning in her prayers. Brother Ricky, good to see you this morning. Continue to hold him up in our prayers. Fred Delman, Jackie Jernigan. Uh, these are some repeat names that we've had on here before. Brother Bishop, a pastor at Victory Church. Continue to remember him. Kirk Thurman has cancer. Remember this. Thomas Western, cancer. A lot of cancer looks like. Uh, Miss Carolyn Lloyd, let's hold her up in our prayers. I don't know if you, any of you know Miss Carolyn. Uh, I've known her for many, many years. Brother Levi, I went and prayed with her this past week, and uh, just a very sweet lady. Got a lot of sicknesses and a lot of health issues, so let's hold her up in our prayers. Uh, Tanya Lloyd had a stroke, so let's remember her also. Brother Hatley's sister-in-law uh, has liver cancer. Uh, Brother Ben Ivey's dad is, uh, been in, is in a bad shape, has been in a bad shape. Let's continue to hold him up. Julie Morris, cancer, more cancer on our list. Uh, Brother Cutshaw is out today. He's been sick the last couple of weeks. Let's hold Brother Cutshaw up in our prayer. He needs a touch. And then Maddie B is, uh, I think this is uh, Caden, I think, Brother Caden, Sister Katie's kinfolks. Uh, She's a, a young lady, young, a baby, basically, a young child, and uh, she's on the vent and uh, needs desperate prayer this morning, just in really bad condition, bad shape. But let's remember that prayer request. Do you have a prayer request you'd like to add to this this morning, anyone? Any prayer request? Let's remember our services, Sister Barbie. Yeah, absolutely. The man that's missing, Mr. Wade Davis, continue to remember this situation in our prayers. Lord knows where he's at, and uh, the family needs to know where he's at, so let's let's pray to this. that uh, I believe something can happen this next week that they'll know, have some closure on this. What do you think? I believe the Lord can do this and move in this situation. So let's pray to that uh, today as we go to the Lord in prayer. Brother Rogers, lead us to the Lord in prayer today. Man, you may be seated this morning. Ushers can come on and take our Sunday school offering. If you have something you'd like to give today, 
The Lord has blessed us all, hasn't he? No matter if you have to give or don't have to give, the Lord's blessing has been rich to us. Don't add any sorrow to it. As I told you, I'm glad to be here today on the 4th of July celebrating our freedom. Uh, my lesson is not about the 4th of July, but uh, I am thankful for the 4th of July that we celebrate our independence for the United States. Seems like watermelon always comes in good for the 4th of July. Uh, homemade ice cream, that's always good for the 4th of July. Blackberry cobbler, right now it's when the blackberries are coming in. That's what. That's some of my fond remembrances of uh, 4th of July's in the past, is eating. Do a lot of eating on 4th of July, but uh, we are thankful for the freedoms that we have. Let me talk to you this morning. I've got a subject that I believe will help us all if we will listen this morning. Uh, this will be a little different norm than some of my normal lessons are. Uh, this will probably be more instructions, instructional than it will be teaching. But uh, And I don't know if you agree with this. Maybe most of you will this morning. Maybe some of you won't. Maybe those that are listening will or won't. Uh, but I believe this is lessons that will help us not only live a better Christian life, but it will help us throughout our life, just in life in general. And a lot of times we try to be something that we are not. I don't know if you've noticed that in people. Uh, maybe it's to fit a certain situation or to please people that are around us in a certain situation, but uh, we may try to be something that we're actually not. I know sometimes people will, you know, to certain events, they will step up their dress codes a little bit and act a little more proper than they normally would around their house, which is a normal thing. And uh, I don't know if you've ever heard someone talking in a amongst a crowd that maybe you knew that person, uh, hadn't maybe known them all their life, but all of a sudden they developed an accent or sounded very proper when they was talking with a crowd. And you think to yourself, well, I know them people. They no use of them trying to put on. I know where they was raised. I know, you know, we played in the backyards together. Uh, but you see this happening a lot. And uh, I see this and uh, I want to say, come back down to earth. Get back down to earth with the rest of us. You see people go off to college sometimes, and uh, when you see them three or four years later, they're educated, and uh, they've got a little different talk about them, you know, and they, they talk a little different and got a little different accents and uh, all kinds of things, and you want to say, you know, I changed your diaper, son. You know, don't, don't act up so high and mighty, you know. You just, and that's the two things I want, I, there's two things I want to talk to you about today. And one of them is be yourself, and the other one is know your place. Be yourself and know your place. Be yourself and know your place. Two very important things for a person to learn in life is always to be who you are. Be yourself. Uh, and then know your place. Know where you should be. I'll tell you a little story. Uh, I got promoted... Uh, to my first supervisor's job, uh, I'd been managing an office for about nine years, and uh, I worked myself up to a spot where I were, was able to be promoted. But my supervisor came in one day. This was as when I was managing my office in Corinth, and uh, he came in one day, and uh, they give you, they go over all your book works, all your loans, all your collections. A lot of things involved in finance, and they cover all, go through all these things, and they've got a checklist as they check off. And there'll be uh, three or four ratings on there. It may be a below requirement, meet requirements, exceeds requirements. It's, you know, there's two or three little things right there that you can do. And that's your report card. That's what they send up. And they come in, and uh, it's, it's kind of like an internal audit. And audit your office, go through your whatever, and then that's what they send up and to the, to the big boys. That's what, your, that's what our raises were based on, how we performed in our offices, how our offices performed. That, you know, I've seen people work somewhere and expect to raise just because they're there. Don't expect to raise if, you can't, if you're not even meeting expectations on your job. There's no use to expect to raise. Elevate your what you're doing to get to where you can be promoted or get a raise. 
Uh, most time, if you don't deserve a raise, you probably ain't going to get a raise. You got to be doing something for it. But uh, on this particular time, this, when the supervisor left, I looked back over my report, and just about everything on that report either met requirements or exceeded requirements. So I knew I had a very good report. So I was hoping when raise time come around, I'd get a good raise, of course. Uh, but about six weeks later, and usually you, our supervisors only came around about, you know, once a year. Well, if your branch was in trouble, they might get there two or three times a year. Uh, but, you know, on a good branch, a good office, they would come once a year, maybe once every year and a half, and you didn't have to worry about them anymore. But about six late weeks later, I drove up in the parking lot, and he was back in my parking lot that morning when I drove up to come to work. And I thought to myself, now, what is he doing here? Back again. You know, supervisors are one of them guys you hate to see coming, you love to see leaving. Their tag leaving out of the parking lot is the best sight you ever saw when your supervisors leave. But uh, I wasn't nervous about anything, but I was, I was wondering what he's doing back so quick. So anyway, he came on in the office. His name was Kent, and uh, we got to be very good friends, Kent the priest. And uh, we got to be very good friends over the course of me managing and him supervising. He was my boss just about the whole time. And uh, we even got comfortable enough together where we played tennis usually a night or two up at Leon's whenever he'd come in for a visit. For a week visit, we'd all go up there and play a couple of nights. We'd play tennis, and very good guy. But uh, I was wondering what he was doing there. He came in, and I said, what are you doing back here, Kent? And he said, ah, oh, he said, I'm going to look through some files and go over a few numbers with you. And I thought to myself, well, you just been here. You just been here six weeks ago and went over hundreds of files. You know, I, uh, I knew there was something going on, but really I just didn't know what it was for sure. I didn't know at all what it was, but uh, he worked there till about lunch and fiddled most time, just didn't do really a whole lot, and uh, he said, Keith, let's go grab some lunch. I said, okay, so we went and sat down for lunch, and I can still remember he ordered uh, water with lemon in it, and I ordered sweet tea. I can still remember it just right where he was sitting, right where I was sitting, and I didn't let the conversation get going long because curiosity was tearing me up. I had to know what my supervisor was doing back so quick because I knew my report was good. My report card looked good. So uh, we ordered our drinks, and I said, Kent, what are you doing here? I said, we're close enough friends. I know you ain't just coming by for a cordial visit. I said, what's going on? Something going on? And he said, uh, well, he said, I want to come by and tell you that I'm leaving the company. I mean, leaving my position. I've been promoted to uh, supervisor over the state of Louisiana. And, uh, of course, I gave him his congratulatories and uh, compliments on the promotion. He deserved it. He's a great, great guy. And uh, I said, man, you'll do great there. And I said, my next question was, who's going to take your place? Because I want to know who I was going to be working for coming down the pike. And he said, well, that's one reason I'm here. I'm here to offer you this job, the supervisor's job. And uh, I was floored. I, I wasn't expecting that at all. I knew my office was a good office. And I knew we were making money for the company, but I still wasn't expecting uh, to get, I wasn't expecting him to leave, first of all. And I uh, sure wasn't expecting me to get the call to uh, bump up to his position. But he told me, he said, you, you'll receive a, you know, a substantial increase in your salary and your bonus structure. And uh, you get a company car, get expenses paid. And, uh, it, you know, he painted a pretty picture. And I said, well, I'd like to talk to Tammy first and find out, you know, to kind of tell her what's going on and see, you know, see if she's going to be in for this or against it. And uh, he said, well, that's no problem. He said, go ahead and uh, call her. So uh, I called her up, and when she said, yeah, you know, go ahead and whatever you want to do, of course. And so I went ahead, and I told him, I said, we're still at the dinner table. I hadn't even got our food yet. I said, well, I'm going to try it, Kent. I'm going to try it. And uh, he said, well, I'm proud. He said, I'm proud you're going to try it. He said, your plane is booked out of Memphis at 9 o'clock in the morning. You'll be, <laughs> you'll be flying to Dallas. You've got five interviews at Dallas. Know all your numbers. This is what you're going to need to know when you get out there. This is what the forms. They had already expected me to take that. They knew, evidently, I was going to take it. It was going to make it so sweet I couldn't turn it down. 
So uh, I did. I took the job, and to make a long story short, this has been about three months, and we went over to Atlanta, flew over to Atlanta to uh, have a like a formal dinner, very formal, it really is way upper class, way way more than I was ever used to. It's too much silverware on my table, first thing when I got there. And I found out if you don't eat with the right silverware, when they come to pick up your plate for your next entree or your next item, they pick up the silverware that you ate with plus the silverware that you were supposed to eat with. And by simple adding and subtracting, by the time your main meal or dessert gets there, you don't have a utensil. If you don't eat with the wrong one, they picked that up, plus picked up the one you should have used, so you don't have nothing to eat with. So I learned after that uh, formal dinner that night, the first thing I'd always done when I sat down at those tables, I put me a fork in my side pocket. <coughs> that was just in case I run out of utensils before the food run out. I still have one to rely on. But we were sitting there that night, and it was, it was way over my head. And there was the president of the company. He was, we had 450 offices, I think. And uh, I had taken over supervision of uh, nine offices at that time. And I thought, boy, you little country boy, you finally arrived. You finally done something. I mean, you've made it to the big boys, you know. We are sitting here with the big guys. Uh, and there was a nice uh, presentation there. And the president got up and talked, and he said, we're going, I'm pleased to announce that Keith Frazier is our newest supervisor. He's from North Mississippi. And uh, he said as a toast, he said, I'd like for us to toast him and uh, good luck and wish him good luck and all this. And uh, he had a bottle of wine, and he was going around pouring everybody's wine for him. This was the president. This was the main guy. And, you know, I sat there for, as he was getting to my table thinking, no, what's the, what little peon me going to do here? I'm a country boy. I'm out of my element already, and I'm the new kid on the block. Do I want to make any waves right here? This is the president of the company, and he's congratul uh, congratulated me in front of all of my rest of my peers and the other guys. Now he's proposed a toast. I could I, all this was going through my mind. I could let the waitress waiter pour the wine in my glass and just turn it up, just let it touch my lips and act like I had took a sip. See, all this was turning through my mind. Or I could just, you know, I could take just a sip. I don't think that'd be enough to send me to hell just to, you know, just as the occasion was there, uh, just pass it back off. And then I thought to myself, now you can either be who you are with this company or you can be a false something and, and people never know who you really are. So when that waiter, waiter, I think it was the waiter, got to me that night. No, it was the president. When the president come around to uh, pour my uh, little goblet with a sip of wine in it, I said, sir, I don't drink alcohol. I said, I'll, I'll take, I'll toast with a glass of water that I've already got. And uh, it seemed a little awkward just for a second. And... Uh, he said, well, I respect the man that is just who he is. That is just who he is. That don't have to, don't sway or anything. Be yourself, folks. You know you're going to be much more respected for being who you really are than a fake somebody else. Be yourself. Don't let the world and this shenanigans play you and let you become something that you're not or that something that you don't want to be. Be yourself. Be who we profess to be. Be real. See, the world can get a hold of fake anything. They can, they can put fake fingernails on now. They put fake finger uh, toenails on their toes. They put fake eyelashes in their eyes. They can get fake hair and make braids with the hair. Uh, you can get, the world can get anything fake, but they cannot find a real, real something until they find God. And they want to see a real you. They want you to be yourself. You remember when Joseph, I'll get to my lesson here in a minute, but you remember when Joseph went down to Egypt and uh, he was sold into slavery, eventually was moved up to the king's palace. 
was the third in command. So over the period of time, Joseph started changing. His culture started becoming the culture of the Egyptians. You know how I know? Because when his own brethren came down there to buy corn, he stood right up in front of them, and they didn't know who he was. They did not know him. His own brothers did not know him. So what that tells me is he had become accustomed to the Egyptians' ways, the Egyptian dress probably, the Egyptian culture, to where his brothers didn't even know him. And finally he said, I've got to quit being this fake. I've got to reveal myself. And he did. He revealed himself to his brothers and said, what you did for evil, God has took it and made it for good to preserve your life. Be yourself. I heard Jerry Clower. Most of y'all know about Jerry Clower. He could tell some funny, funny stories uh, from Yazoo, Mississippi. And uh, uh, he, he just had, I mean, he, he can just rattle on about Marcel Ledbetter and all that bunch down there just kind of puts you right there. But there was one time that I heard him when he was uh, in a real serious mode, and you didn't get that very much out of Cherry Clower, even though he was a Christian guy. And uh, But he played football at uh, Mississippi State University. And uh, he said when he went down to Mississippi State that uh, there was a guy in there, he played quarterback, and he said he was always popping off about how much money his daddy had and they had this when they was at their house, and they had that, and, you know, he was real leopardy, and they wanted, he wanted everybody to know he had arrived, you know. This is my name. I'm going to be your quarterback, and, uh, I, you know, I'm the big man here, and uh, really had that kind of attitude. And Jerry Clark said one day they had a team meeting, and they were sitting in a big room assembled there, and the coach was up uh, working off the board, and, telling them the X's and O's of the games and the plays and how they were going to run these plays. And uh, he said the, the room was, you know, full of the team and coaches, but he said they had a big glass door where you entered the room that you could see out of the glass door. And he said uh, he could, there was an old gentleman that walked up to the door, and uh, he said he was kind of fumbling with the lock. You could tell he was kind of... Uh, out of place, really didn't know where he was, might have been at the wrong place, uh, but he did, really didn't know, so uh, he kept fumbling and finally got to find where the door lock was and unlocked the door and walked into the door where they were having the team meeting. And uh, he said, of course, everybody turned around and looked, and he said it was this old gentleman with uh, wrinkled old clothes on, shabby clothes, and uh, so obviously, he was embarrassed. The old man was embarrassed when he came into the wrong room. Uh, but Jerry Clark said, I'll never forget. We had a big lineman. His name was Pete. He was about 6'4 and weighed about 280. Big dude. And uh, he said, when he looked over there and seen that, he said, Coach, would you excuse me just a minute? This is my daddy. And he's just come, come in. He was bringing me something up here to school. And he said, I want you to take just a minute so I can introduce him. He said he went over there to him, put his arm around the old man and kissed him on the cheek and said, guys, this is my daddy. And if it wouldn't be for him, I wouldn't be at Mississippi State today. Jerry Clark said, I learned right then, be who you're going to be. Be yourself. Be yourself. If you want to get somewhere in life, be yourself. Be who you are. Don't forget where you come from. And be yourself. Now, let me talk to you about the second part of this lesson. Know your place. I'll have to expedite some of this to get through it. Know your place. You know, most times, the problems that come up in our life are created by the man that looks, or the woman that looks back at you in the morning time when you look in the mirror. Most problems that you have in your life are caused by the person that is looking at you when you look in the mirror. And it's either because we are we're not where we're supposed to be, we're totally out of our place. We're out of where we should be. A lot of times people try to be the pastor when they've never been a pastor. That's not our place. My granddaddy was a pastor here for 40 years, and he said this many, many times over, if you want to know how to pastor a church, ask somebody that's never pastored a church because I can tell you all about what you need to do. 
He said, if you want to know how to raise a kid, ask an old maid that has never been married and never had a kid. She can tell you everything you should be doing with your kids right now. That's the way this is. We've got to stay where we're supposed to be. We're not the judge. We've got a supreme judge that judges us all. We all have to measure up to the same thing. We're not in the place where God put us, and it makes us look foolish sometimes, very foolish. It creates unnecessary burdens and headaches that we would never have to deal with if we would just stayed in our spot, if we had just stayed in our place. We, you know, I got my hands full with me. That's my biggest issue is taking care of me. If I can keep my doorstep cleaned off, I got a full-time job. It needs to be swept every day. It needs to be wiped off every day. I don't have time to go over to your house and sweep your doorstep if I'm keeping my doorstep where it should be. If I'm keeping my path the way this should be, I don't have time to clear out your path. I got, I got my own weeds to clean out of my own garden. I don't have time to come over to your garden and help you weed your garden if I keep my garden where it's supposed to be, if I keep my garden clean like it's supposed to be. But when I walk over to inspect somebody else, you know what I'm doing? I'm neglecting where I should be. I'm not in my place that I should be. Matthew 7 and 1 says, Judge not that you be not judged, for with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Do you know what a mote is? This is a small piece. It probably was the, ch the chaff off of the wheat when they blowed the took a fan and or fanned the wheat and the chaff blowed off of the wheat so they could get to the wheat clean. It's the husk that's on the wheat. That's what it is, the husk that is on the wheat. Can you imagine how small that is? Well, I can't see that in Brother Roger's eye from right here. I might can see him rubbing his eye, but I, I, can't, see, I can't see a moat in his eye. And then you multiply that with me having a beam in my own eye. You know what a beam is? That's a stick of wood. I've got a stick of wood in my own eye, and I'm trying to get a little piece of trash out of Brother Roger's eye. This is Jesus talking. He said, Or wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the moat out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye. And then look at what the next verse says. Thou hypocrite. Boy, I mean, he put it out there straight. Thou hypocrite. I, I'm not calling you a hypocrite. That's what the Bible's calling you. If you're, you know, if, if you're the Cinderella that this shoe is supposed to fit, just wear it and correct it. Thou hypocrite. First cast out the beam out of thine own eye, then thou shalt see clearly to cast out the moat out of thy brother's eye. This is Jesus speaking. He's the supreme judge. Does that mean you cannot identify sin that somebody else is, is in their life? No. We're supposed to identify sin. We know what sin is. We know what the Bible says sin is. We know what that is. We can identify sin. And the Bible says that you will know them by the fruit that they're bearing. That's for you to know. That ain't for you to go gossip and tell your neighbor, though. That's for you to know. You know, the only instructions that Christian folks have by Jesus himself is pray for them that hurt you. Do good to them that despitefully use you. That's what the book says. Don't return evil for evil. Return good for evil. That's the only instructions that we have. That is the only instructions. Hello, Tyler. Good to see you this morning. My grandbaby's here, y'all. I hope she is anyway. Know your place. Know your place and stay in it. 
Uh, this is what I thought before. Some people are going to be surprised when they get to heaven and see somebody else there that they thought didn't have a chance. And a lot of people are going to be surprised when they ain't there themselves because they think they've got it all together. Let's read in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Just remember, folks, we're not called to be the pastor. We're not called to be this. We're not called to be this. You, you don't want to put up with the junk that the pastor puts up with anyway. Most of y'all are the one that calls it. Or us. Most of us are the one that calls it. Don't put your place there because you don't want the responsibility that he's under. Don't try to pastor the church if you ain't a pastor. Well, this is getting no amens. Probably won't even get an offer now of this. 1 Corinthians 12. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, look who he's talking to. He's talking to the church. I would not have you ignorant. Now don't be ignorant and don't be a hypocrite. Don't be ignorant and don't be a hypocrite. You know that ye are Gentiles carried away unto dumb idols, even as ye were led. Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accused, and that no man accursed, I'm sorry, accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Ghost. So now let's look at this next verse. Now, there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. Notice what, what we've got here. We've got there's several different kind of gifts. There's several different kind of administrations. They several different kind of operations, but it's all on the same on the same hood. Still one motor. May have an alternator, may have a carburetor, may have points, may have spark plugs and spark plug wires. It's all one motor. And that's what that's what this uh, passage is telling us that there's going to be gifts and administrations and operations, and they're going to all look different, but it's the same spirit. Now, we, we had this saying in the finance company, and this, this is still holds true. It's hard to take a banker and bring them into the finance company because they're used to more administrative work and not used to operations. But you can take a person out of the finance business that's used to getting his hands dirty and getting down with just a muck and a mar. And you take him and put him in a bank and he flourishes. Now listen at this. But the manifest, manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit withal. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the same Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, diverse kinds of tongues. To another, interpretation. But all these worketh that one and self-same Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. For as the body is one and hath many members, all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink unto one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, Because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, Because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? 
But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body, as it hath pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, yet one body. Now let's skip to verse 28. And God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. God has put all of this in the church. All of this is in the church. The apostles, the prophets, the preachers, the gifts, the miracles, the diversities of tongues for one reason. For one reason. To perfect me and you. It's for the perfecting of the saints. He hasn't called us all to preach. You know, just because we get a good feeling every once in a while and uh, get some goosebumps running over us, every one of us are not called to preach. Yeah, I believe if God is going to call you to do something, he's going to give you the capabilities of doing it. You're going to be able to do it and do it well. Granddaddy told this many, many times. You know how you can tell when somebody's called to preach? They can preach. If you can't preach, you probably hadn't been called to preach. And this may hurt some of your feelings. I hope it don't. But, you know, if, if you can't carry a tune in a bucket with a handle on it, you're probably not called to sing. That would be, God would be really confused if he knew that you couldn't carry a tune and stay on pitch and keep your timing. He, he, he would be... A, that would be confusing if he told you you were supposed to lead the singing. Now, you may think in your mind you're supposed to lead the singing. But you're not supposed to lead the singing if you can't carry a tune. That's somebody that's a singer. That don't mean that what your job is is not just as important, but that's not your spot. Know your place. Be who you are. And know your proper place. Now, don't let that hurt your feelings. If a teacher's job comes up and you feel like you're a teacher, present that to the pastor. And if, you, if he feels like you're the teacher you should be, you'll probably get to be a teacher. You might never be the song leader, but you might be the best teacher that this church has ever had. And if you were up here trying to lead singing when you were supposed to be teaching, you're, you're going to look foolish, and you're going to feel awkward all at the same time. It's just not a fit. It don't work for you. Be yourself and know your place. I don't know if this is getting through to any of you or not. Exactly right. This is here to perfect us. Paul says that he gave us apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the perfecting of the saints. There's a perfect job for every member of the body of Christ. How many believe that? There is a perfect job for you in the body of Christ. There is a, now, if you get out of place, it's not going to work. Not only is it going to affect you, it's going to affect the body. You say, well, what I do don't really matter to the church. Does, did I not just read you where there's an ear, and there's an eye, and there's a hand, and there's a foot, but it's all part of the body? If you're an ear, listen to me. If you're supposed to be an ear and you're on the, and you place, just imagine if you could take the ear off the side of your head and sew it to the bottom of your foot. That seems kind of odd, but do you know your, hear, your ear's not going to do you no good down on the bottom of your foot? You can't walk with an ear sewed to the bottom of your foot. You can't walk. You know what that done? That affected the whole body because one member was out of place. Because one ear was out of spot. Out of the proper place, it affected how the whole body worked. Now the body is going to look deformed. It's going to walk with a limp. You know why? You got an ear on the bottom of your foot when it should be up on the side of your head. That's the way the body of Christ works. If you're not in the proper place, the whole body of Christ looks deformed. 
and out of place. And it's limping instead of walking and running. It's not functioning the way the body should function because we're not in our proper place. Does that make sense to you? Paul said this in Ephesians 4, I beseech you. In other words, I beg you. That's what beseech means. It means I beg you that you walk worthy of the vocation that you're called. Walk worthy in the vocation you're called. Now, this thing can have a lot of meanness, meanings to it, but it, it says with lowliness and meekness and long-suffering, forbearing one another in love. Why? Because there's one body but many members. If we're out of place, the whole body is deformed and is not functioning like it should. Not only do you look foolish, we look foolish. Listen, folks, I believe God knows what our capabilities and abilities are. That's the reason he deals different gifts to different persons, different people. That don't mean, just because I told you a while ago about singing, that don't mean you can't sing because the Bible says sing and make melody in your hearts. It don't mean you're supposed to be up here leading them. It don't mean you're supposed to be leading the singing. It don't mean you're supposed to be a song leader. There's one job in the body of Christ that is perfect fit for you. And there's no, no one part that's less important than the other part. You've got to have it. If you don't believe it, stick some cotton in your ears. The ears don't work near as good as it did. Put some blinders over your eyes and try to walk around. You find out your eyes, you know, your eyes is probably, you think, well, that's probably the most important thing on my body. Until you realize that touch is so important that, you know, you wouldn't, if you couldn't feel pain, you'd probably burn your fingers off. You'd burn your hands up. You'd burn, you'd burn your whole body up. Because you, you, then you realize how important that the that feel is. Your fingers are, the touching are. Everything is important in the body of Christ. We just need to know where we fit. Let God make you the best that you can be. You're not the best you can be in the army if you're out of spot. Even the army has certain spots that you have to perform in. Certain regiments you have to uh, adhere to. You say, well, I don't feel as important as somebody else. I feel like I'm the, I feel like I'm the pinky toe on, in the body of Christ. I feel like I'm the least, uh, just the least of the least. I'm on the very bottom. I'm at the end of the foot. You know, I don't feel, have you ever stubbed your pinky toe on a bedstead or on a piece of furniture? that you didn't know was sitting there? You know for about the next week or two, you're going to be limping around because your toe is throbbing and hurting so bad every time you put weight on it? You know somebody who sees you walking down the street and you're doing this right here? I, they might even come up and ask you, hey, man, what's going on? You hurt your leg? No, I hurt the least important part of my body. I, ain't, I, I shouldn't even be limping. No, you don't say that. The other night, I got up during the night to go get me a drink of water, and I hit the end of the bed, and I believe I broke my little toe. See, that's how important even the smallest member of the body is. It is so important. If, if it's not functioning correctly, the body's not going to function correctly. We're all members of the same body. Well, let me finish up here. Jeans rung the bell on us, so that means our time is short. Tell you what, I'm not even going to tell the next story because I don't have time for it. This is what I want to tell you. Be yourself and know your place. Be who you are, be real, and know your place. Be real, be who you are, and know your place. I hope you've enjoyed the Sunday school lesson this morning. I promise you, if you will take these lessons and apply it to your life, it's going to help you out all throughout your life. All throughout your life. Uh... If you don't like who you are, then you can change who you are. Be yourself. I had a, I interviewed a lady one time. Uh, she was interviewing for a job, and uh, when she came in to interview, she didn't look like she didn't look like she was interviewing for a job. Not the kind of job I had. 
And uh, she filled out her application. I may have told you this before. She filled out her application, and uh, I decided I was going to talk to her. I mean, outside of just normal talk. I mean, you really sit down and talk, you know. So I sat down with her, and I said, uh, tell me about something that uh, you've been able to accomplish in your life, uh, your lifetime, something you started on, maybe a project you started on, and how it wound up, you know, just kind of left the floor open. And uh, she sat there a few minutes, and she said, well, I can't think of anything. Oh, you can't think of nothing you've accomplished in life. So I said, well, maybe when you was in school, maybe there was a school project that you worked on and uh, either was part of a team that worked on it. Uh, do you have any time that you've been uh, like part of a team and what your team was accomplished? She said, I don't, I don't think I have. So I tried. I said, I'll give you the third shot. She'd worked four or five different places. I said, four or five different places you've worked. I said, surely there was a time where you were assigned something by your supervisor or your boss and asked you to complete this and uh did you have that she said no she said i don't really remember anything and i said well i can you give me anything to go on can you give me anything she said well i'll just i'll tell you i'm a fast learner and i'll give you a hundred percent of what i've got i just went through there and asking her what she had Everything she told me, I didn't want. And I thought to myself right then, surely we we can be ourselves. We can tell something that we have done in our life for the Lord. I didn't want any. I didn't want anything that she was offering. You can't you can't get a job if you ain't got nothing to offer. When I left Gene's shop, uh, I told you this before. But when I left, I worked for Gene Sanders for. Uh, about two years, probably two, two and a half years. When I left the shop over there uh, and went to working in the finance industry, he went forever before he hired anybody. It seemed like six months. So I asked him one day, I said, how come you ain't hired nobody in my spot? He said, well, you didn't leave a vacancy. So that kind of makes you think. I must have not have been in my proper spot. I didn't know my place. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the Sunday school lesson today. Happy Fourth of July to you. Our hearts to hands, <laughs> our hearts to hands calls for canned ravioli, canned spaghetti.